Have you ever heard the phrase, life is complicated? Is it? Oh yeah, it is. And now we say that because life is hard to predict, right? And the things that you agreed with or believed in or supported last month can change in an instant. Yeah, you ever done that before? You change your mind on something? I hope everyone hands their hand. That's just kind of a sign of maturity, I think. Randy? <laughs> Listen, you just got to raise your hand. Randy, I'm going to call your name every time you don't raise your hand, brother. Okay? All right. Who thinks their pastor's handsome? Randy, put your hand up. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Did my wife have her hand up? I don't know. No, she didn't? Oh, boy. All right. Well, I'll just have to tell a story about you today, honey. Your mind changes all the time. I mean, your friends can change. Someone who was your friend last month may not be your friend this month. Your life situation can change from Monday to Tuesday. The kid you raised five years ago or two years ago or one month ago is the different kid than you're raising today. Life is complicated. And I think people want to turn to God because they want predictability and consistency and a foundation for stability. Well, I'm telling you today, friends, that is not a reason to seek after God because God is not predictable. God is unchanging. He's, it's, the philosophers and theologians will say God is immutable, meaning he doesn't change, but he is not predictable. You can't predict who God is. So don't seek after God for predictability or even stability because your foundation will change. God is going to move you because sometimes the things that God does are not the things that you want to do. They don't make any sense. Why? Because God does not want the same stuff that you want, not necessarily. And because of that, sometimes you are going to struggle because the two of you, you and God, are going to be moving in opposite directions. And he is committed to pulling you back in line with what he wants for your life. The purpose he's defined the future that he has established. Now, we're reading the book of Acts, and we've been doing this for a while, and we got 20 more chapters. Who's enjoying the book of Acts? Good job, Randy. He's catching on. He's really enjoying it. I'm enjoying the book of Acts. Just, there's a lot more to go, but we've learned a lot. We've learned a ton about who God is and what he wants from us and what he wants for the church. And as we're reading this book, as we're reading the book of Acts, going into chapter 8, Things are going really, really well for, the, for, for this new church. Again, they don't call them Christians. They're mostly uh, people of Jewish, Jewish ethnicity. And they call themselves The Way. It's the name of the early church. The Way. And things are going great. They got this great community and people are coming from far and wide. And people are getting healed. And they're proclaiming the name of Jesus. And, and widows are being cared for. And the poor are being cared for. And the marginalized are being cared for. And they're healing and they're sharing. And everything's incredible. It's growing. Everyone's excited. People are excited about church. It's going great. And, and they're facing a little bit of persecution, right? Like there's people... The people who are in charge, the people who executed Jesus, the ruling authority, they don't like what's happening. And so they call them in for questioning. They do this several times, but nothing really comes of it, comes of it until this man named Stephen is persecuted. And persecuted in, in a really big way. Stephen is executed. He's killed. He's stoned to death. And as soon as this happens... As soon as Stephen is killed, all heck breaks loose. All heck breaks loose. And it says in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, On that day, on that day when Stephen was persecuted, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered through Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Okay, so Stephen's killed. And a huge persecution breaks out. It seems as though that the death of Stephen was a catalyst that all these people who are antagonistic to the Christian faith, 
It's, it's what they needed. It was the catalyst. It was that, that moment that they were waiting for. And once this happened, remember this man named Saul, right? He's the one who held the coats when, when Stephen was, was being stoned. This man named Saul becomes just inspired, I guess you would say, to destroy this new religious movement. He's inspired to destroy this group of people who are following Jesus so devoutly. And he goes house to house, arresting people, even, even, in, even women and children, and throwing them in jail. It's a terrible situation. Why did this have to happen? Like, what, what the heck? What, what the heck? I mean, th- things were going well. You ever just be thinking about how good life is? and then your car breaks down. Okay, who, who's got a car repair budget? Ray just got a hands up. <laughs> you got a car repair budget or you just know what it's like when things go bad, when things are going good? Just raise your hand. I, look, I know you're supposed to have a car repair budget. We had one for like a minute and then we repaired it and then there's no more car repair. Like you're supposed to have one, right? But like, who's got one? I don't know. When things go bad, they go bad. And when things are going good, like things are going smooth, then you can't get sick or, or you got to get surgery or, 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 or something happens with your, your, your bank account or you get a bill you weren't expecting or, or the basement starts leaking or, or n- new tires. New tires aren't an excuse. You should be, you know, they're getting bald. Okay. But you know what I'm talking about? Things just go bad and, and, and all at once. It happens all the time. Yesterday, Laura Penix came to borrow my car, and we were joking this morning. Uh, I saw her in the, 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 the driveway. I'm like, is she going to try to come in my house? I didn't brush my teeth. I know it's noon, but I get up late. It wasn't noon. It was like 9.30. And I got laundry everywhere. Oh, no, she's getting out of her car. So I hurry up, and I get to the door. And I open it real quick, and I shut it. Because my house was not ready for company. Now, I love company, and I love Laura, and I love Chase. And you know what? I love all of you, and you're all welcome to come to my house with proper notice. We need six hours, right? Six hours. My wife is feeling stressed out already because she leaves. She's like, I'm going to buy paper products. She'll, She'll be at the dollar store for eight hours while we're cleaning, right? And I'm telling you, the kids are like, oh, no, we're having company. And they're like, you know, they're like wiping stuff down. And, and people come over, and, and I, I like the look that people get. They're like, oh, my goodness, how do they keep the house so clean with all them kids? And they kind of feel bad about themselves for a minute because their house don't look that clean. I love that. <laughs> love it. And then, and then I'm all, so I say something like, oh, excuse the mess. <laughs> we just washed the baseboards, right? And then they leave. And we sit there for about 20 minutes. We're like, oh, yeah, it's still clean. And then about 40 minutes later, it's a disaster. That's how life is, right? It's a lot of work, and it's good for a minute, and then it's just a mess. And that's what's happened in the early church. It was good. Things are really, 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 really good. They're going great. But then suddenly, widespread persecution. The scattering of people from their, the center of their religious life out to foreign lands, Judea and Samaria. They're leaving Jerusalem. And there's even home invasions and arrests. Why is this happening? Why would God allow this to happen to this beautiful, precious, devout group of people? Why? How? Why? Life is complicated. But maybe if we keep reading in verses 4 through 7, we maybe, maybe we get an idea. Now, again, verses 1 through 3, that's all about persecution and scattering and, and home invasion. But verses four through seven is a little different. It's got a little different feel. Here's what it says. Those who were scattered began preaching the word wherever they went. Philip 
went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. He's talking about Jesus. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw sign, the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. Do you remember the story about the women, woman in the well? Remember that one where Jesus talks to the woman at the well and she's like an outcast. She's marginalized. He welcomes her in. Do you remember that story? Of course you do. Amen. Randy, raise your hand. Thank you. Okay. This is the same place. Philip's going back to this foreign place where Jesus first proclaimed his very nature to this woman, to this outcast, embrace this woman, and Philip's going back. And he's talking about Jesus, and they're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, we, we remember him, right? So he's talking about Jesus, and then it says, for with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was what? Great what? Read that word. A little louder. What, what, what was happening? Joy. joy. There was great joy in that city. So what's happening? This mess is going down in Jerusalem. All this persecution is going down. This guy, he, 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 his name is Philip, and he goes where? Where does he go? Samaria. Okay, now, if, if you can try to think of this, we don't have, like, any rival cities. Pittsburgh, okay, Pittsburgh, okay. So, imagine going from Cleveland to Pittsburgh. It's like, you know, what, an hour and a half, two hours? About two hours, okay. Okay, so, so, so this is what Philip's doing. He, he's, he's going to a different place, a rival city, and he's talking to people who he doesn't necessarily like. They're, they're like his cousins, ethnically, okay? Bad cousins. Black sheep cousins. Why is he there? They were kicked out of where? Jerusalem. Cleveland. I was trying to mix the two together, but it doesn't flow off the tongue well. They were kicked out of Jerusalem. And what's he doing? What are, the, what are the, some of the verbs here? He preached, proclaimed, performing signs, and he's healing. And what was the result? Joy. 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 So it looks like Philip was doing the same thing that they were just doing in Jerusalem, except now instead of the ethnic people who live in Jerusalem, these Jewish people, it's now Samaritans. It's a different group of people. And now they're hearing the word. They're learning how to give of themselves. They're learning the importance of community. They're being healed and they were filled with joy. Why did this happen? Because the church was scattered. This early group of Christians were forced to take this local movement, this very localized religious movement, this very local movement for this very specific group of people and take it regional, right? They went off a distance. They left their home. They went relatively far away, and the good news of Jesus moved. It spread. It migrated. And very soon, this local and regional faith system would go international. How? Can I, can I get verse 3? Because this guy, what's his name? Saul, Mr. Drag you out of your house and throw you into jail. He's about to be used by God and take this local religious movement international and into your living room in Independenceville, Ohio. So for these early Christians and all the apostles and Saul of Tarsus, they think before this scattering, before these activities, they think 
that they are doing exactly what they should be doing. Saul, even though he was doing evil things, thought he was doing what was right. They thought they were living in their purpose. God says, no, that's not it. Life is complicated, and so am I. So you gotta move. You gotta go. And because of this, the church will go international. And we're gonna read all about that for the next 20 chapters of Acts, how this church spread into this global movement. But understand that God is moving and disrupting and reorganizing because he wants the mission to move forward. This movement of God is not just intended to be a niche spiritual group of one ethnicity or in one place. And when we read the book of Revelation, you know, you, the, the, who, what's the first book of the Bible? Genesis, and then the last one is what? Revelation, right? And when you read the book of Revelation, this is this description of the future. And we see this description of the future when Jesus returns. And it says, as I looked, there before me was a great multitude that nobody could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne in Jesus. So how do we go from a group of Jewish Christians in one central location to this worldwide great movement of all people and all tribes and all time? How do we get there? The scattering. The persecution. That's how we get there. It forcibly does what the church people would not do on their own. It moves them. Now, I've been saying, as you read in the book of Acts, we are talking about the grand mission of the church. And in this passage, we see that the mission is diversity and expansion and inclusion. But it also shows that God is willing to redirect us to get to that aim. God will move you. God will put tension in your life. God will put walls up. God will say no to move you in that direction. But what does that mean for us personally? What does that mean for me? That sometimes God says no. Or sometimes even bad circumstances will happen in my life. Well, life is complicated. And bad things are going to happen. Now, I'm not saying that God is the cause of that. Not always. God doesn't cause any evil. And sometimes the bad stuff that happens to us is the result of someone else's free will decision or our own dumb mistakes. How many people done something dumb? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. We all do dumb stuff. But if God isn't the cause of it, if God doesn't put these circumstances in our lives, he will certainly use them. I love to say that God doesn't waste anything. Nothing that happens in our lives is wasted by God. So how do we navigate this? The bad and the good and God's place in it. I think that there's three things that we have to understand to figure this out. When I'm dealing with bad circumstances in my life, sometimes I got to see the bad before I can get to the good. Sometimes the good and the bad happen all at once. And sometimes the bad is all we see. Let's talk about this. When I was 18 years old, I worked in a nursing home. And I was dating this girl from Avon Lake. Her name was Amy. And, 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 and I really liked Amy. I would drive to see her all the time. And, and my car broke down. And I remember going into work. And I was at the time clock. And I was so stressed out. I started to cry. <laughs> Don't act like you didn't cry over a girl, men. Little Randy's raising his hands again. I started to cry 
And this lady named Betty, I'm gonna tag you in this Betty. Betty's great, love Betty. She's like, buddy, don't worry, it's gonna be okay. Oh man, you're gonna be all right. You just, you're a great guy, you know, you're, it's gonna be all right. All right, well, it didn't work out, right? Me, me, me and Amy, we weren't a thing for much longer. And I was in that like feeling that sometimes you get like that forever alone. Anybody ever feel the forever alone? Yeah. Man, Randy's like, he's waiting. You know, I was in that forever alone sort of, sort of, sort of feeling. And, and I remember I, I was at work another time and I ordered some Chinese food and I got a fortune cookie. <laughs> and this fortune cookie, it said, the one you love is closer than you know. And it had my lucky number on it too. You know, on the bottom it's got the numbers? Well, my lucky number was on there. And I was like, this is talk, this is like, I, I don't know if I believe in God, but this is from God. It's got, it's, it says the one you love is closer than you know. And, and at this point, I'm, I remember, I'm telling you the truth. This is not pastor, like, fabrication. This is a true story. I stood up. And I was like, what? The one you love is closer than you know? And the only woman I had any real contact with, beside Betty, now Betty was cool, but she was a little older than me. Don't, never, I'm gonna delete that from the video in case she watches it. But the only woman I really encountered or hung out with who, who that I knew, I worked with her, but she had expressed no interest in me. She was very beautiful. She was all grown up, and she specifically told me that she was into guys who like to work out, okay? So I knew it couldn't be this, this woman, but still, I read the fortune cookie, the one who you love is closer than you realize, and I said out loud, Andrea? Yeah, that one. This is, this is a true story. Lord, I just want to thank you for using Jade Garden Carry Out in Madison, Ohio to deliver me my wife. Praise him. That's a true story. True story. So, amen. That's it. That's all I got. So, it's cute. It's a cute story. It's true. But here's the thing. That's a representation of what God had already been doing in her life, in my life, right? It was leading us through really difficult circumstances, bad decisions, dysfunctional family, feelings of loneliness and loss and depression. And he brought these two people together who've been married like over 20 years, but less than 25 is a 22. I did that on purpose. It's 22, girl. 22 beautiful years of marriage and I love you. That fix it? Okay, you're so cute. Okay. But see, God did it, right? He, t he, took, he took a history of 18 years of dysfunction in my life and, and 19 years of dysfunction in her life and brought us together for something good. God used those bad choices, bad decisions, bad circumstances to shape us. So when I'm dealing with bad circumstances in my life, sometimes I got to see the bad before I can get to the good, which means I have to trust God's process. But sometimes the good and the bad happen all at once. I'm sure you've heard people say things like, you know, while I was going through my illness, I learned. Or when I was going through my divorce, I learned. Or when my kids left the house, I discovered. Or when I was between jobs, I understood. Right? When I was going through it, I learned or felt or experienced something bigger or greater or more beautiful. A lot of the time we don't see it or understand it, or rather we don't see or understand the blessing until we are out of the trial. But sometimes we understand that during the trial is when we grew. If we have eyes to see it, if we have the perspective to see it, we can see that God is working even when we are struggling. Sometimes the struggle is just a bridge to the blessing. Sometimes the struggle is just a bridge to the blessing. And you can have both at one time. You can have a struggle and a blessing happening all at once. 
Now, I know this is, uh, it, it, this could be hard to talk about and we won't, don't want to think about it and we're just sort of over it, but it's relevant here, so I'll mention it. We, we just went through a global pandemic, right? It, it was awful. If I gave you 15 seconds to think of 10 words to describe what we went through for the last two years, you'd think of 50 and that all be wor- like bad words. Maybe not bad words, but maybe they would be bad words because that, that was awful. It was an awful time. And I don't know how it impacted you. Uh, it seemed hard on our family in many ways. So I'm sure it was hard on yours too. But if I'm honest, in spite of all the terrible things, I can also see some of the blessings that our family experienced. Look, I, I developed a new friendship with my wife. I, I learned who my kids were. Like I spent so much time in my life ignoring my children or not caring about who, who, who they were or, or what they loved. And I didn't get to know them until our family went through this. Now, we've had these conversations in our house, come to terms with seeing and experiencing so many awful things, but also at the same time, seeing the good things. Sometimes the struggle is a bridge to the blessing, but that doesn't mean the struggle isn't real. It it doesn't mean that the struggle didn't hurt. Life is complicated. Life is complicated. God is complicated. But sometimes the blessing and the bad thing happen all at the same time. So when I'm dealing with bad circumstances in my life, number one, we got to see the bad before we can see the good and trust God's process. And number two, sometimes the good and bad happen all at once. So we have to see the blessing in the struggle. But sometimes, sometimes bad stuff happens and we don't get to see or understand the resolution. Like, we're never going to know why. We're never going to see it. Sometimes bad things happen and and we don't have any understanding of what on earth God is doing and how is all this going to come back for good because I can't see it. You know, last week we talked about Stephen and his death and how Paul, or rather Saul at the time, was holding the coats of the men who were stoning him. How could Stephen in that moment have any understanding that God was going to do something incredible with that very man? How could he see? And here in Acts 8, the person, if if you're a a mother and, and, and a father and you're dragged out of your house and you're sent to jail, all because of your faith, how are you possibly going to understand that God would use this for some people in Samaria? How would you even know? How would you know? There are things that you're going to go through that you don't understand how and you don't understand why, but God is going to use them. What's important is to develop an eternal perspective because this is going to change everything. What's an eternal perspective? It means your purpose and your calling and your actions are not bound or constrained by time. That this present experience is not our destination. So that when bad things happen here, it's not permanent or forever. And it means there's a much larger or grander purpose and plan and goal for your life that transcends time. That goes beyond forever because a part of you lives forever. This is helpful when you are trying to find a parking spot. Uh, Hannah... And Becca, I know this is a a surprise, but you guys, can you guys come on up? You ever have to really use the potty? It happens to me every time I carry my podium up here. I'm like, oh man, I should have I gone in the bathroom first. There's a point to this. You ever have to, you ever be driving, you gotta, go, you gotta go to the bathroom, you gotta go to the potty, okay. Let's say the two of you are driving. You got a doctor's appointment, and you got a doctor's appointment too. You know, you, you gotta fight. Here, let's come over this way. Okay. We're gonna go this way. You got a fight coming up, you wanna get a physical, right? You're gonna, you're gonna get physical, so you gotta get a physical, right? Okay. And you guys are both going to your doctor's appointment and you really gotta use the the bathroom, okay? 
and you're trying to find a parking spot and it's like three o'clock on a Friday and everybody else got an appointment too, right? And you see this parking spot and you're like, yay. But then she takes her parking spot because you're not very aggressive, right? Like you're, and she, she you know, she, she got a bigger car. She, she, she likes to fight people, okay? Um, and, and so she takes that parking spot and you are so very upset because there's no place to park. She gotta go to the bathroom, you know? And so you park way back, like way back. And, and you get out of your car. Well, and then it happens. It happens, right? No judgment from me, okay? Okay, no judgment. But you, you're not gonna go to your appointment now because you just peed your pants, okay? You just, she just peed her pants. And so she gets in her car and she drives off angry. You're mad and you're like, I was praying for that spot. God, why'd you let me down? I peed my pants. I missed my appointment. Now I gotta get, get scheduled another one. You know you're mad, right? Now you didn't know this, but you wanted to get your physical. And the doctor who's checking you out is like, okay, something's up with, with, with her. And, and they found that she had a clot in her lung. And the doctor said, now listen, I got some nurses in here. Don't you start telling me how unrealistic this is. I don't care, okay? I'm telling a story. Mind your business. Okay, so you, the doctor says, if you would have been, like, walked a little further or been in here 10 minutes, you could have died, right? So your life was saved because you got that parking spot. Now, you're upset. You, you peed your pants, okay? She peed her pants. And, and, and you're mad, mad at God, mad at everybody, had to schedule your appointment. And you never know. You, you would never know that her life was saved because she got that parking spot that she was praying for too. But there's only one parking spot, just one. And you got it. Now, is it worth it to pee your pants so that someone else could live? Sure. sure. Just throw them in the wash. Throw them in the wash, will be fine. So like absolutely 100%. She says, sure. You know, I, I thought I'd call Hannah because she was going to be like, praise the Lord, amen. Yes? Yes, okay. She said yes. She's very emphatic. It's worth peeing her pants if someone else would live. Okay. Let's change this up just a little bit. Same scenario. You got the parking spot. You made it just in time. But you, you got bit by something a couple days, spider, spider, okay? And your arm is already looking weird, like you're, it's turning black and stuff. And, and you gotta like walk even longer. And by the time you got through triage, it was like two hours later. And the doctor's like, you're so septic. We're gonna try some antibiotics. You know, they, it, you, you lost your hand. She lost her hand. Nurses, don't you tell me it's not realistic. I don't care. I mean, I care, but not just, not, not right now. If you tell me you're gonna preach next week, okay. So you have to lose your hand, but she got to live. Is it worth losing your hand so that she can live? Yes. She said yes, of course. Of course it's worth losing your hand so someone else could live. But you never knew, right? And all your life you're thinking, man, if I could just got that parking spot and like my life has changed. I, I, like it, like I, you've got this issues with body image and like, you have to use adaptive equipment and, and, and life is hard, but she lived. And you're wondering, God, why didn't you answer my prayer? And now I got, I, I'm missing a hand and I, things aren't going right. And God, you know, love me and why do bad things always happen to me? But she lived. And you'll never know that. Now let's change this up just a little bit more. But this time, you're the one with a bad heart. She still takes your spot. But you're the one with a bad heart. And on the way in, you have a heart attack. And you, rec I mean, they bring you back, you know, they, you, 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 you make it for a minute. And you die in the hospital six weeks later. And your family can't understand it. She loved God, and I know she prayed to get to the hospital. And why God, God let her down? And why would he do this? Why would God do this to Hannah and to our, uh, to our family? But what you wouldn't have known, and what your family wouldn't have known, is that you were in a hurry because the organ donor team called you up and said, you got to get here. Because you 
were gonna give your kidney, okay? And the person you were giving your kidney to, they were gonna give part of their liver to someone else. And the person who, who was getting the liver was gonna give part of their lung to someone else. And it all started with this chain, right? I saw it on New Amsterdam. I saw this on TV. It happens, right? Amen? Amen. It was on TV. Yeah. All right. Praise the Lord. Okay. So, so your life helped save three other people's lives. Now, you would never know. Your family would never know. But when both of you were praying for a parking spot, God said, there's only one, but there's three people who need to live. See, this thing's happen, stuff, kind of stuff happens all the time where people are in need and they're struggling and things don't go their way and you'll never see how or why, but God is working behind the scenes, not just for you, but for the greater purpose of all his kingdom and all his children. It happens all the time. Thanks for helping guys, I appreciate you. Bad stuff happens and we are never gonna know the how or the why. But having an eternal perspective can help with this. Understanding that it's not, not all about you. And there are plans and purposes and lives and circumstances that are far too complex for you to ever wrap your mind around. And you can't figure it out. Life is complicated. And you can't figure it out. But God can. God can figure it out. And you can trust him to handle it. <laughs> you can trust him to work through it. Even if it means things aren't always going to go your way. Now, when I'm dealing with bad things in my life, number one, sometimes you've got to see the bad before we get to the good. Number two, sometimes the good and the bad happen all at once. Number three, sometimes the bad is all we see. So we have to trust God to work in all things. Now, pastors like lists. <laughs> every pastor is going to give you a list every Sunday. It's always going to be three. I'm going to sneak in one more. Just a little one. The goodness of God never changes. There's that, like, mantra that we have, right, in the church. I said, God is good. Okay, let's try this again. There's this mantra we have in the church where I say, God is good, and you say, uh-huh, we all know this, right? It's true. It's not just a mantra, it's true. The other day, or well, the other week, my family was a little concerned about one of our children. They had this, like, potential um, health issue that we were kind of worried about, right? Like just for a couple days, really, really worried about. And, you know, it turned out to be, to be nothing at all. And I, I was texting my elders um, and I said, God is good. And then I said, but you know what? Even if my child was sick, God is still good. Because there's people who get sick really sick. There's people who struggle or suffer. People who go through it. But that doesn't change the nature of who God is. He's still the one who gave you all the gifts that you love. The children, the laughter, the joy, the beauty of the skies and the mountains. the way a baby smells or the way a puppy makes you smile or the way helping people brings you to life. All those things are from God. So it doesn't change his nature when things don't go our way. He's still God because his good work extends beyond my circumstances and even my life on earth. When I see God as always good, I can accept my circumstances and look to how I can grow or, or be used in the middle of them. When I can see that God exists for eternity 
and he's called me and designed me for eternity, I can understand that my present circumstances do not determine who I am or who he is or how he feels about me. It's just what's going on now. It's just what's happening today. And what's happening today doesn't influence my future in him. It doesn't influence his love for me. It doesn't influence his care for me. It's just what's going on today. I want us to pray together. We're going to pray and we're going to worship. But as we pray, just take a moment. Can you be audacious enough to thank God for a circumstance or something broken that he restored? Can you do that? Can you think through that for a minute? Can you thank him for what he did? Thank him for how he used it. Acknowledge his presence in it. Acknowledge his goodness in it and even ask him to help you heal through it. Because he'll be there for as long as it takes. As long as it takes. His love endures forever. Now take a moment to tell him that you trust him in something that you are going through now. Can you think of that thing? Something you're nervous about, something that gives you anxiety. Something you can't see yourself through. You just say, Jesus, I trust you. It doesn't have to mean 100%. You don't have to know how it's gonna end up. You just have to believe that he does. Jesus, we have seen you work so clearly throughout history. We have experienced your working in our hearts. And sometimes we don't remember and we get frustrated with our circumstances. We feel the hurt of things we've lost. We feel the pain disappointments and broken relationships or mistakes that we made. What's incredible is that your love is big enough to love us through our doubt and love us through the moments where we lack faith. You can love us through our insecurity and you can love us through our anger and our bitterness and you can love us through our negative thoughts and you can love us through the times that we are so full of pride and you can love us through feeling like we don't amount to much and you can love us through the sense that you aren't enough for us. You can love us through all these things and Jesus, the fact is you did love us and you've claimed us and the victory is already yours. We belong to you, Jesus. We belong to you. Remind us, give us faith, help us to see you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.